All right. So backend APIs. Let's do. I don't want slideshow mode. I want center view. Is it still sharing? Cool. All right. So yes, today we are going to be talking about uh, third-party APIs in Django, and basically, when we played around with APIs back in week four, we were doing a pattern where we were hitting from the front end the API, and then we were then sending the response straight back to the front end. This is not very secure, especially if your API is going to require authentication. This is where having the API in the back end comes into play. Having the authentication exist server side prevents any visibility on these otherwise um, vulnerable keys and sensitive data in the front end. So our pattern is going to be hitting or sending our requests from the front end to the back end, which will then go out and authenticate through the API. The back end will receive that authentication and then pass it back to the front end. So back end API authentication allows requests from the back end where credentials can be kept secure and APIs can be inaccessible from the front end due to something called the um, same origin policy, or also it could be due to a lack of the cross origin resource sharing policy. These are both policies that help to make browsing more secure. I believe you've all already wrestled with cross origin resource sharing policies a little bit in one of the exercises uh, earlier in the cohort it can be a pain, a troubleshoot. So one of the best ways around this is to just go through best practices of what uh, a typical API authentication flow should be. And that's what we just covered, which is sending requests from the front end to the back end before you authenticate via API and then back to the front end. One last thing, I guess, let's go back to that last slide. Uh, the typical pattern for bypassing, not really bypassing, actually, that's not a good word, because we're really abiding, right, by the cross-origin resource sharing policy when we do things the right way. So what's the expected behavior is from the back end, you specify origins that you allow as... Um, having admission or permissions to make these requests. And so typically when you're implementing an, an authentication flow, it will be in the back end where you determine what URLs will be allowed. And if your requests come from that URL, then it will pass cores. Acquiring API keys. This is a very regular part of working with APIs. Again, you've already played with a few of them. So I believe you already know that many of these will require you to sign up or to at least um, give them your email because everyone loves to collect customer data, user data. And with an, in exchange for that, you get an API key or a secret or whatever, depending on the API itself. And this is what you use to create a validated request to the API. The rest of this is just sort of extra background knowledge that we don't really need to memorize for now. Uh, there are two types of keys. There are public keys, which are safe to use in the front end as they are non-sensitive. So keeping these exposed is no big deal because they will usually come paired with a private key, which do need to be protected. So especially when using APIs that cost money as impersonator, impersonators can run up your billing. So private keys should not be stored in Git repositories, and we will walk through the best practices for preventing that from happening. It's pretty simple. I don't know if you've already started playing around with environment variables, but the standard practice for that is you store your secure keys in an environment file, which you then make sure 
is inside your Git ignore, so it never gets pushed. And we have um, in our code a way of reading from this environment file to authenticate requests. Any questions so far? Cool. So general API integration, we create our user account, we sign in, we read the docs, we test API keys. In this case, I think we are gonna be using for our demo, something called the noun API. The noun API, um, let's get rid of all these extra tabs because there are way too many tabs. The noun API does require some authentication. So I've already signed in using my Google account. I went over to somewhere. When you first sign in, it's going to take you to your profile where you can see your secret key. Not sure. Oh, it might be in this page. Usually after you've created a secret key, you can also, there's there is also an API endpoint you can hit to retrieve that key in case you lose it. Or sometimes uh, an API will tell you that you need, you absolutely need to store this key as soon as created because once you lose it, it's gone forever and you don't have, you'll need to request a new one. In our case, I'm not gonna spend too much time trying to worry about how to access my user profile or the noun project because we don't really need all that. We just need to read about authentication, how it works, we grab the endpoint for whatever API we're trying to hit. We read some docs to understand how it works. In this case, we are going to be importing this, well, these two libraries actually, requests, which you'll be using for virtually everything to make requests. And in this case, we're going to be using OAuth to authenticate. There are many, many, many different authentication flows. and which you use will depend on the API you're using. In this case, Noun Project wants us to use OAuth, and the pattern for OAuth is basically passing in an API key and a secret. We then hit our endpoint. Well, let's say we store our endpoint in a variable so we could pass it into a request, which we then hit with a request, and it will send back a response. Pretty simple. So with that said, let's take a look at how some of this code is gonna look. We're gonna run through the slides real quick. It's the exact same thing that I'm gonna demo in um, VS Code, but repetition I think will be good to familiarize yourselves with the flow. We start with a Django project. We create our virtual environment. We install our necessary libraries. Again, in this case, requests and OAuth. And we then write out any necessary starting code. And we then securely store our secrets and keys in an environment file. We add our environment file to a git ignore. This is really good practice. Um, a lot of times, um, well, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. A lot of times in a professional working environment, wherever you land, your Git ignore will already have the uh, environment file in it because whoever created the repository for you is following good practices. But if you're starting a new project, you will want to remember to add the environment file to your .git ignore. Once you do all that, you write out an API call. Um, in this case, before we actually commit to writing any code using the API, we could do something simple, creating like a temporary file where we can test the API and the validity of the key and secret that we were given before we have to commit to any code. So this is another good practice to do whenever you get any new um, secret or key from an API, a new API. Uh, let's see. How this is going to look is we write our temporary file, we import our necessary libraries, 
we just like in the documentation, create an OAuth object where we pass in our key and value and we define our endpoint. We then make a request and we handle the response. An environment file is a very, very, very simple file. It's really just a hidden file that can contain an unlimited amount of variables. So in this case, we're storing our noun API key and our noun secret key in an environment file. We're also defining what environment we want to work in because in a typical live scenario where at whatever organization you land in, you're very likely going to have multiple environments. You can have either staging or dev or both, depending on where you work, as well as prod. And typically what's going to happen is your repository is then going to have a lot of various configurations, which will, which will have conditions that will change based on the environment that's currently loaded. This way, the exact same code base can be built and deployed through these various environments um, with very minimal uh, shifts and changes. Oh, cool, Phil's in here today. Hey, Phil, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's see, once, you, again, once you've added the created your environment file, you want to add it to your Git ignore, super important. So that's why I'm like harping on it numerous, numerous times. And once you do all that, you'll have to actually read from the environment file, right? So we've only moved our key and password to the environment file. Now we have to read from it. So we go back to our temporary file. We import these two um, dependencies. OS allows us to access system files. You've used this many times before. Load underscore dot env is probably new. And it's basically just used to read the key value pairs inside of the environment file. Now we send a request and it's probably gonna return something like this, which just looks like a bunch of nonsense. So there are ways to clean this up. One of those ways in Python is to use pretty print. So if we were to import pprint, we can create a pprint object, uh, pprint.prettyprinter. We pass in some params. In this case, we want to indent two times, and we only want to go a depth of two into the nested objects. So with that, we then update our print statement from print response JSON to pp .pprint response JSON, and that will magically convert our alphabet spaghetti into this somewhat prettier response. Uh, from there, we are ready to actually, now that we've tested our API, we know it works, our secret and key are confirmed to have worked. We can now actually toss this into our Django code. And we are going to be doing this using converters and URL dispatchers, which make up the URL routing system in Django, along with views, I should say. So converters are basically classes that include the following. Uh, regex class attributes, um, which is a, which in our case, we're not going to need because we will be using a string converter. So the output would, will already be a string. It also consists of a method to underscore Python, which handles converting the match string into the type that should be passed to the view. And it should raise a value error if it can't convert the value. And the value error is then interpreted as no match. And as a consequence of a 404 response, which will be the product of that no match, uh, that's what's gonna be sent to the user unless there is a URL match. So, Oh, the last thing is the to underscore URL method, which is what handles the conversion of the type into a string to be used in a URL. And this should raise a value error if it can't convert as well. 
URL dispatchers are components that are basically used to map the URLs to specific views, essentially acting as a router and directing the incoming request to the appropriate view. I believe that's it. Yeah, I think the rest are unfinished slides. So let's switch over to um, VS Code and let's see some of this in action. Okay, where are we? I've already spun up my Django project and if anybody does want to run along, I believe in today's README, we are using day six of the Django Pokemon example. So I've already ran my Docker Compose up. So all of that is just chilling on, in this terminal. In this terminal, I've activated my virtual environment and I am ready to start running some code. Let's start with the uh, scratch.py and let's delete some of the stuff that we, well, let's not delete, let's just comment them out for now. So where you're gonna start is you're likely just gonna have your import requests from requests OAuth. Let's see all of this without proper practices. We're just going to be lazy developers and we're gonna have exposed secret and secrets and whatever the other thing is. Key, I think, ID. I'm gonna grab my ENV, this is where I have my exposed secrets. So let's that. Again, the OAuth library will allow us to, it just takes in these two parameters, which is basically your ID and secret, and it will then pass this along to the request along the endpoint. So let's run, go up one directory, I'm gonna run, what is scratch.py, I'm gonna save first, and let's see what happens. We get our ugly nonsense response. And if I wanna to try to read through it, it looks like just a lot of nonsense. I'm gonna clear my screen because that's hurting my eyes. And I am going to now, Oh, before, before we do the pretty print, let's go ahead and let's say, yeah, we would be making our environment file. This is where we move in our noun and our noun key and our secret key. And that's gonna change this previous entry to this. And we wanna then make sure that the environment file is in our git ignore. So when we do our push, the environment file does not get pushed along with it. And no one outside of anyone that has access to our local machine will be able to see these sensitive keys. So with that, um, let's now do the pretty print. Yeah, you know, let's get that in there. We have to get these two things in to be able to read from the environment variable. And now if I run this. Why is it doing that? Oh. I need to call the load.env first.
I wonder why this stopped working. I've got my environments, my my virtual environments set up. Let me make sure. Does anyone see any typos or anything? I don't. If you pip list, do you have the dot in the vim? How was that not there? It's so weird. an issue with the package mentioned above not fit wow now this is really weird because i just ran this like 30 minutes before class started <clears throat> is it in the um requirements.txt uh good question let's see it's not, but Okay, I use the three install instead. Let's see if that works. Bummer. Let's see. I don't know if it'll make a difference from the, I, I'm looking at the docs and I, did you do pip install python dash dot end? Um, I think Jordan might have mentioned it in the chat. You yeah, said I was about to ask the same thing. Pip install um, Python dash dot env. Uh, like this. So... Um, just dot env all is one word. Okay, let's give that a shot. Already satisfied. Already satisfied. I see, I mean, Editor is not throwing any issues, so it's not having any issues finding it. And I do have the right compiler selected. I've got 3.11 down here, and this is pointing to, yeah, 3.11. see hey julius i just sent you something i found online okay okay dot env for main and then we all right let's flip that one more time main dot load dot env 
and then when we os.getenv. So instead of that, is that look good? Whoops, don't want to do that again. Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something real quick. I'm gonna exit out of this. I'm going to run what I'm trying to run on this side. It's working from this terminal, but not this terminal. I am the same directory, right? Okay. I can't explain exactly what's happening because I do not know for sure. I It might have something to do with the virtual environment because we can see on this side where I originally did all this earlier, where I first ran my pip installs, the request works, but it's failing here. And to be honest, I have been experiencing virtual environment issues. So it might be time to upgrade from OS 11 to OS 14. I'll worry about that later and we will move on with today's lesson.